Hi, welcome to The Voice Podcast. My name's Amy, and what you're about to hear is an interview with Hamish Gray, talking about his experience at COP26, what he wanted out of it, and what actually happened. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good, Hamish. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Good. What you are coming for a second. I going to have to talk well, about COP alone. Oh no, I, I couldn't find, like I didn't get a notification saying um, Voice had gone live, so oh, okay. hopefully I don't have anything muted, that uh, <laughs> wouldn't really give a good impression. Yeah, <laughs> no worries at all. So Hamish, um, you are obviously a journo at Voice and mm-hmm. you spent the last week at COP26 in Glasgow. Tell us a bit about your experience with COP and how you got to be on the press team. Well, getting on the press team took quite a bit of time. Um, It wasn't as if there was a lot of massive hurdles, but it was just a lot of small things you had to do. So first it was applying, seeing which organisation you're part of, giving evidence that you've written about climate change and UN issues beforehand. Um, And Tom, our editor, had to send in um, a confirmation saying that, oh, we actually want this person to go to COP. Um, He's not just taking the initiative on his own. Um, it, I think the strangest part was when I had to FaceTime like one of the officials just to show that my face matched my passport. <laughs> um, which was, it was, it, it, she seemed so just tired. So it must've been doing that for the whole day, just people <laughs> going in. Um, and experience in COP itself, I've actually never been in the Scottish Exhibition Centre. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was interesting in and of itself, but it was such like a, the best description I can think of is a hive of just so many people buzzing around. Everyone seems to be having their own very important thing to be hanging on with. Um, people taking photos everywhere. The building itself, um, the interior design was actually very good. Which is not something I should really have made note of, but I guess it, um, spoilers for the rest of the interview, but that's one of the few bits I was impressed with. Um, oh. So I quite... A, a good experience, just a bit um, hectic from time to time. I mean, when the thing that you're, you know, most impressed with is the interior design at a climate change conference, that's not <laughs> not the result I'm sure you were hoping for. But um, tell us what you were expecting from COP, and were any of those expectations met at all? I'm going to sound like a huge pessimist here. <laughs> I wasn't expecting a lot in terms I I expected people to sort of use it as like a publicity thing to show oh here's what we're doing for climate change and maybe those promises won't be met and um sorry could you repeat the question is it just what I expected or what I expected and if it lived up to that yeah so what were you expecting from COP and why those expectations Mm -hmm. met right um those expectations of a lot of talk and no real solid plans were somewhat um, met to an extent that there were decent plans on the table Mm -hmm. which which is always good to hear and like the amount of people and organizations had gone that was really promising because it seemed like everyone really wanted to be involved and I know some uh, nations didn't send uh, their, their main leaders but at least everyone still had a representative so that was quite positive but in terms of real trust that this will lead to very solid radical action that we need I wasn't entirely convinced I wouldn't say right and do you know like off the top of your head what were some of those plans that were floating around well one of the events I went to it was talking about um, how corporations will handle uh, climate change and Mm you know, what targets they'll have. And that was mostly going on about how, right, we need to establish a firm set of guidelines that companies can involve with. And a lot of it was about, um, and and this doesn't just apply to the the business event too. A lot of people were talking about the localization of resources, which I suppose is quite important because the less you're taking from, you know, you're importing from Mm -hmm. across the world, the less carbon emissions you're going to be producing. So that was quite good to hear but those were mostly the charitable organizations that were talking about that um so for example the un they were talking about how they would try and push for better climate action and how 
they have their own carbon footprint they're going to try and offset through like the localization of mm -hmm. uh, resource procurement and even just leading by example was a big thing um, so there were decent plans in, in place and I'm, I'm sure nations have all talked about their the goals for reaching net zero by 2050 that seems to be the very firm like we all want to reach net zero by 2050 I, I guess there can still be a bit of um, uncertainty as to what each nation defines as net zero so I suppose that's where the mm -hmm. um, points of contention might come in. I mean, it's not necessarily the charitable organisations that we want to hear from, is it, though? Like, were the bigger oil companies or the, the real, you know, culprits when it comes to carbon emissions, were they saying anything of note? Were they committing? Um, well, there was, again, at the business meeting, there was the sort of issue I had with it. All the large companies, they didn't really have representatives there. The only people who were there in, in that meeting were people who are trying to convince them to deal with climate change. Uh, and a, a lot of, in the uh, side event stalls, there were quite a few companies and they were all talking about their own um, goals and carbon trading seemed to be quite a big one where they'll plant X number of trees or, or put funding to X number of climate change things to offset their own emissions. But uh, I mean, I, I, obviously I'd need to look into the science behind that to really see how useful that would be but it seems to me that just something like a, a token all right we've planted this amount of trees that means our emissions are suddenly gone whereas yeah that's not really true but planting trees is free reign to just continue to operate as they have been yeah mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah i can see where the pessimism is coming into it hamish i'm really not <laughs> feeling it <laughs> no i'm really trying um, to like be very hopeful because one of the events i did go to was about optimism and the whole thing, I was just like, ah, oh, I really wish I could buy what you're saying. <laughs> so speaking of the events, tell us about some of the others that you went to and what were they like? Well, most of the events I went to were the standard, here are a few folk talking about something on a panel, go into the audience, watch, and then oftentimes it'd be a Q&A. Uh, I think the ones that really stood out to me, well, one of the ones that stood out to me for kind of the wrong reasons was the intergenerational inquiry uh, between just the the whole premise was young people their voices matter so let's have a, a intergenerational dialogue mm -hmm. between you know people from earlier generations and the younger ones um, and that was very promising to hear about but when I, sh when I showed up to the event it, it was great to see it was completely full with young people and the, the panel uh, they were all from the, I don't want to say older generations, but earlier generations, I suppose, yeah. is a nicer way. <laughs> um, and there was also a youth panel too. Uh, the only issue with that event, well, not the only issue, there were quite a few, uh, was it, it seemed to me that the only people speaking were the earlier generations. So they had a very long time to talk. Then we had a video where, um, and this was quite nice to see, Jane Goodall, gave a presentation about her um, work, which again is, is really good work. And all the people speaking, they had, you know, good points. They were talking about quite important issues. One of them talked a lot about how the fact that COP26, the main language is English, can be quite exclusionary to a lot of people who can't, who haven't had the resources to learn English or mm. um, that leads up to a bit of lack of inclusivity. So really important issues, but they felt like they could have been taught somewhere else because this was supposed to be giving young people a voice and they tend to just speak for ages interact with each other and then at the end they'd ask one of the youth panelists so what are your thoughts and they'd give a quick sound bite and then you'd be like okay great and move on and the part that really rankled about that was there was supposed to be this big q a at the end they talked up at the beginning and by the time we got to the end because all these people had spoken for so long there was only time for one question and that question was just someone saying, hey, the stuff you guys have said, it isn't good. Like um, the, the big thing they were talking about was we need to empower the young through education um, and inform them and get them to go from protest to suggesting ideas. Mm -hmm. But the, the big issue with that is, and, and anyone can, can tell you this, young people are very involved with climate change and they're already very involved. The, the issue is really that we're not listened to. and mm -hmm. 
no young people, um, that there aren't any young people who are given a seat on the decision making table. So the questioner just basically ratted about that for a bit. And it was a very like, oh, you know, we were, we were all fighting for the same thing sort of reply. And then one person at the very end had to kind of force a question through. And, and she basically said about uh, how the people that we, the young people had chosen to represent them were given no time to speak. So kind of not a very impressive event. Um, no, practically speaking. I mean, it kind of sounds like the whole event just proved the point that young people aren't listened to about climate change. You mm -hmm. called it, you know, an intergenerational discussion or dialogue, and then all you've done is talk. So, mm -hmm. oh, Hamish, okay. <laughs> oh, there was an event that was actually, I liked quite a lot. Dulcie actually was able to go to it too. Um, it was in the side event room, there is a space for just Dialogue and it's, it's called interconnectivity and dialogue space and they do little seminars throughout the day and you can rock up to it And it was actually a coincidence that me and Dulcie went to the same one, but that was quite interesting. It was nice to have a bit of Sort of sincerity because the group of us came around and we all talked about our feelings and call mm -hmm. and everyone had a little really interesting input um, So I think more of that would be really refreshing less panels fewer speeches and more getting people together to actually talk, uh, even if they disagree. Mm. But in that space, was it mainly just young people talking to other young people? Were there any mm. older ones who were there, you know, listening in? It was actually a, a good mix. Um, okay. Oh, but like, you could almost see just about half the room quite young, other half um, not so. It was really, and, and nobody seemed to be pushing their voice above the other, which was mm -hmm. quite nice. They wouldn't seem to be willing to listen and I'm willing to talk too, which is good to see because it was uh, a bit more open and, uh, and free than other dialogues, quote unquote, that mm -hmm. attempted. Okay. Well, just for clarity as well, Dulcie is another voice journalist who is still currently at COP26 for the rest of the week. So do keep an eye on our story for more COP coverage from Dulcie. Um, so Hamish, there were a lot of protests at COP26. Did you go to any, did you talk to any protesters? What was the vibe like? Well, when I first got into Glasgow, I actually spoke to a few folk from Extinction Rebellion. Mm. They sort of had a, a group in uh, George Square and I was just talking to them about what their hopes are for the event, what they, what they see as the success of COP. And again, I think this might not be too surprising. They weren't very hopeful about COP. Uh, I think their perspective is the people who have caused this problem are trying to give us the solutions. Uh, so they weren't too cheerful in that regard, but they seem quite positive in terms of the response to the protest. Cause uh, I think we all know like the protests that happened in the city were huge and, and they went on for quite a while. And I know there was uh, like some conflict, but it seemed to me that most of the time they were very positive and just that we need to take action. Um, so the people from Extinction Rebellion were mostly talking about the way they see success is for awareness to be spread, not in delegates, but in just people on the ground uh, and, and to get people to be engaged. Uh, so, which is something, you know, I agree with people being more engaged with it rather than just, you know, an oil company CEO or someone, just people in general caring about this. Uh, that sort of seems to be the way forward. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, there were some protests I, I, I did pass and it would be quite interesting seeing a huge line of folk and it was, um, they were from everywhere, like there was so many different flags, there was kids, there was old people, um, there was a guy dressed as Santa Claus with Sustainer Claus written on his back, which was <laughs> interesting. Um, so I, I guess like theatrics were on display, mm -hmm. um, but the, the general vibe seemed to be that COP has been built up by the organizers of COP as this huge event for climate change and they want to put their thing forward. So the protesters decided we're going to make this a huge thing for us too, uh, which I think has been quite effective. I know Dulcie um, actually went and got and walked in the marches, I think talked to a few people. Uh, so I think she'd like have probably better insights um, or, or more insights into that. Mm -hmm. Did you not fancy walking among the protesters? <laughs> well, it would have been cool, but my thing was it takes like 
an hour and a half just to get in to call <laughs> the actual building. So once I was in, I was like, right, this is me today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to nip out for lunch and then spend like two hours getting back in. No, uh, that's totally but, understandable. But, uh, no, I, I think I, I think I, I should have, but it was um, just that, and then outside of work, I'd, I'd be quite busy. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of the press coverage on COP has been quite negative, and I know your feelings on this already are you don't think that COP is going to solve anything. Do you have any kind of glimmer of hope or optimism about it at all? Um, let me think. <laughs> I, again, the fact that everyone is addressing the issue now is a positive sign. Um, the fact that we've sort of gone from, in, in not too long ago, people debating whether we should try and reach net zero to going to saying, all right, we all agree we need to, re we need to reach it, now we need to figure out how to do it. So I think the positive thing is we're not going to go back to climate change denial or trying to say that, you know, but this isn't really going to be that bad. We mm -hmm. people kind of know it's going to be bad. Um, damn, I'm supposed to be hopeful. <laughs> uh, people, well, people know it's going to be bad, but now people are definitely going to be doing things about it. The only point of contention is what they do. So again, awareness being spread. I think the fact that every well, Edinburgh and Glasgow are, are they've got cop stuff everywhere. Uh, I think, and, and this event is being broadcast around the world. Mm. Again, everyone's going to be tuned into it, and people who wouldn't normally think about it, even passively, will have absorbed information about it. Um, so, yeah, oh, awareness has been raised. So, I think this event, the fact that it happened, is perhaps the, the best point of it mm. um, in terms of just what it's going to do for the climate change discourse from now on. I mean, don't worry too much about being optimistic. Square, and I was just talking to them about what their hopes are for the event, what they what they see as the success of COP. And again, I think this might not be too surprising. They weren't very hopeful about COP. And I think their perspective is the people who have caused this problem are trying to give us the solutions. Uh, so they weren't too cheerful in that regard. But they seem quite positive in terms of the response to the protest because uh, I think we all know like the protests that happened in the city were huge and, and they went on for quite a while and I know there was uh, like some conflict but it seemed to me that most of the time they were very positive and just that we need to take action and um, so the people from Extinction Rebellion were mostly talking about the way they see success is for awareness to be spread not in delegates but in just people on the ground and, and to get people to be engaged uh, so which is something you know I agree with people being more engaged with it rather than just you know an oil company CEO or someone just people in general caring about this and uh, that sort of seems to be the way forward mm -hmm. so, um, other than that there were some protests I, I I did pass and it would be quite interesting seeing a huge line of folk and it was um, they were from everywhere like there was so many different flags there was kids there was old people and um, there was a guy dressed as Santa Claus with sustainer claws written on his back which was <laughs> interesting um so I, I guess like theatrics were on display mm -hmm. um but the the general vibe seemed to be that COP has been built up by the organizers of COP as this huge event for climate change and they want to put their thing forward so the protesters decided we're going to make this a huge thing for us too, uh, which I think has been quite effective. I know Dulcie um, actually went and got and walked in the marches, I think talked to a few people. Uh, so I think she'd like have probably better insights um, or, or more insights into that. Mm -hmm. Did you not fancy walking among the protesters? <laughs> well, it would have been cool, but my thing was it takes like an hour and a half just to get into COP. <laughs> The actual building so once i was in i was like right this is me today yeah <laughs> i'm not gonna nip out for lunch and then spend like two hours getting back in. no uh, that's totally so, understandable but, uh, no i, I think I, I think i i should have but it was um just that and then outside of work i'd, I'd be quite busy so mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the press coverage on cop has been quite negative and i know your feelings on this already are you don't think that cop is going to solve anything do you have any kind of glimmer of hope or optimism about it at all? Um, let me think. <laughs> I, again, the fact that 
everyone is addressing the issue now is a positive sign. Um, the fact that we've sort of gone from in, in not too long ago people debating whether we should try and reach net zero to going to saying, all right, we all agree we need to rank, we need to reach it. Now we need to figure out how to do it. So I think the positive thing is we're not going to go back to climate change denial or trying to say that, you know, but this isn't really going to be that bad. We mm -hmm. people kind of know it's going to be bad. Um, damn, I'm supposed to be hopeful. <laughs> uh, people, well, people know it's going to be bad, but now people are definitely going to be doing things about it. The only point of contention is what they do. So again, awareness being spread. I think the fact that every well, Edinburgh and Glasgow are, are they've got cop stuff everywhere. Uh, I think, and, and this event is being broadcast around the world. Mm. Again, everyone's going to be tuned into it, and people who wouldn't normally think about it, even passively, will have absorbed information about it. Um, so, yeah, awareness has been raised. So, I think this event, the fact that it happened, is perhaps the, the best point of it mm. um, in terms of just what it's going to do for the climate change discourse from now on. I mean, don't worry too much about being optimistic as long as you're being honest. I mean, yeah. that's the main thing. You are a young person who went to COP, you've experienced it. Like, that's why I want to hear from you because, you know, giving you that voice. Um, so just before we wrap up then, what kinds of things did you actually cover? Because I know you've got quite a lot of COP stuff on the Voice um, mm -hmm. website at the moment. So what was your, your main takeaway? Well, I wrote up quite a few, quite a few articles just about... Um, the events I attended, um, I'm going to be collaborating with Dulcie on talking about the, the dialogue space. Mm -hmm. uh, a big part of it was talking to um, people there and, and just taking footage and, and pictures of all that was happening. Mm -hmm. There was always something interesting going on, which was quite cool. Um, there was one point that was quite embarrassing where I was sitting down writing on my laptop and then a group of journalists started appearing in front of me with cameras and figured, oh, they're taking photos of the scenery behind me. And then I heard a voice uh, and it was, there was Bear Grylls was standing right behind me giving a presentation. <laughs> so, I was, oh God, I need to move quickly to get on the shot. So um, yeah, just because there was always something happening, I, I was generally like snapping pictures, taking videos, um, talked to a few young people on the young person's day, talked to, um, I talked to, <laughs> Uh, a guy dressed as Darth Vader outside the building because I wanted to know why he was dressed as Darth Vader and then he started singing in Spanish so um, that was okay. again just another random thing uh, and I why? talked to someone from the evening project oh sorry go on so why was he dressed as Darth Vader what was the it was to get people to come talk to him so I guess in my case that worked uh, and it was largely about this new technology that sounded a little bit science fiction to me but i'm not an engineer so I, i'll have to reserve judgment on that but okay and the eden project you spoke to somebody from yeah and um, I, I talked to them they gave they gave me an interview but they need to check with their media bosses if they're allowed to actually get it published so i'll, I'll put it up if if they can if he gets a confirmation mm -hmm. um, but that was interesting just looking at another event that tries and tries to promote the idea that everything is connected, including all living things, and then trying to get that into communities too. Mm -hmm. So, so many people there cared about climate change, and I think that is, you know, the, the positive side of it. Yeah. Did you not fancy having a chat with Bear Grylls? <laughs> <laughs> I felt a little underqualified for that, to be honest. He had such a huge crowd around him that I just thought, I would have to sledgehammer my way through, and I'm just... <laughs> I'm not. I'm not that uh, forceful a journalist, you know. Yeah. Not yet. You are. You an accredited not Hamish. <laughs> you had every right to talk to Bear Girls as anybody was there. So <laughs> very, very disappointed. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Next time, don't pass <laughs> off an opportunity. Okay. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. So, is there anything more, in your opinion, that you want to say about COP or just about what people can be doing in general to? raise awareness and help save our planet? I think, again, I don't want to parrot what I've already heard there, but just being informed and knowing that, you know, the, the way forward is to uh, attend protests if you can, 
um, talk to people about it. If, if you know someone, even even a, a parent or someone who isn't too, who thinks climate change is just a bit of nonsense, you know, mm. talk to them. Just open discussion is really important. Uh, and I think if everyone's talking about it, then more and more positive action will, will happen. Yeah, I agree with you. Join in the conversation, everybody, about climate change, because it's not going anywhere, sadly. And by the sounds of the results of COP, it's really not going. Anywhere. Oh, it's so sad. Okay, well, Hamish, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for giving us the insight into COP26. As I said, Dulcie will remain in Glasgow for the rest of the week and she will be um, covering COP to keep an eye on our story and of course our posts on the website as well. Today's episode was made possible by Voice Magazine, an online platform for young people interested in art and culture. You can read Voice over at voicemag.uk and find it on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook as voicemag.uk. The voice contributors are also on Instagram over at voice.extra. If you're looking for another podcast to listen to, the contributors release the Voice Extra podcast every Saturday, where they talk about the pieces they've produced and the culture they've been enjoying. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us to make more with a donation of any amount at voicemag.uk slash donate. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for use of the track Thief in the Night. You can find more of his work at incomputech.com. Tom Innes was the executive producer and Amy Clulo was the editor.